even even as he was throwing me out, I was still like, this, this is, is amazing. This is amazing. I've been thrown out of Method Man's dressing room. <laughs> this is so dope. to um, sit on this stage with you. H how does it feel? How does it feel knowing that you're going to have your play on at the National Theatre? Oh, I don't even know. It's like overwhelming joy that I can be a part of this and that this huge, powerful institution, I can find my way to occupying some space within this and trying to use it for good. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, believe me, I, know, I feel I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. um, did, was it something that you saw happening? I mean, when, when, I, when I say that, when you were young, was the National Theatre a place that you could imagine your, your experience, your world, your, your vision being accepted? It wasn't really on my radar. Um, I don't think I became like aware of it uh, as a as like a goal or anything like right, that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't yeah. like that, but not really in terms of how it applied to my creativity. What about yourself? Like. Well, well, no. I mean, I I I remember coming here as a kid, and um, there was a massive picture of. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I should be saying this, of Laurence Olivier. Yeah. Um, blacked up mm. in, the, in the foyer outside. And um, in the whites of his eyes, I wrote, shame on you. And then came back a while later, a good, good while later, good, good while later, to see the same picture somewhere else but obviously not with shame you written on it. And uh, to be here now in this position, you know, sitting here talking to you literally right now, it still feels like the most absurd reality. And whilst we understand that, you know, countries, places, people evolve, evolution is always happening. I didn't necessarily think it would happen in my lifetime. I didn't necessarily, I think I was always looking to put in something out that would mean the next generation didn't have to go through what I went through or that this building could belong to somebody else mm. that looked like me. I really didn't think that, yeah, I'd be in this position. Did you think that when you were young, how, how comfortable was it to allow people to hear your voice? Mm, that's so interesting. Uh, for a long time, I didn't, didn't say it out loud, you know. I, I used to listen to my friends well, they, we would sit around, like, hanging out or whatever, and they would be rapping, they would be sharing mm. lyrics. And, like, I didn't want to draw attention to myself at that age. I'm no, sure you no. have... You can understand, like... Also, my friends were, were, like, men, blokes, boys, like... And I wasn't, so... It was, like... Maybe not feeling like I could just take up the space in that way. I don't know. But I was writing all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, but I didn't connect what I was writing with the love that I had for lyricism or rhyming. Right. I just, they, I, the things felt different, you know. And then one day, a really close friend of mine, fantastic musician, drummer called Quake Bass, he had this, like, keyboard called a DJX. Mm. We used to sit in his flat and he would be on, his, on the buttons, like, making beats, and I'd, like, be at the other end of the keyboard, like, just getting one little, like, whoop, like, <laughs> every now and then, like... <laughs> Like, whatever. <laughs> and eventually he just said, like, you know what? You need to find your own thing. Like, you need to find your thing. Like, I have my drumming, I have my music. Uh, you right. need to find yours. Like, yeah. But, like, him saying that, I really remember it clearly. It made me think, well, maybe my thing is this writing that I do that I don't tell anyone that I do. Maybe my thing is this thing that I've always had, which is how I feel about words. Mm. And then it was like slowly, 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 I started getting my, um, started like gearing myself up to being like, actually, yeah, I've got this lyric, like <laughs> I'm ready to share it. And then 
Eventually, I found out my friend. And then he just went nuts over the phone. He, I, I, he was there with another friend of mine. They were both just, oh, on the phone. <laughs> and then it was like, OK, this Friday, we're going to Deal Real, which was um, this record store in Carnaby in, Street. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Did you ever yeah, go there? Yeah. No, no, I, know, I knew about it. I knew about it, oh, yeah. It was an amazing place. For context, it was, yeah. it was like a, uh, a record store in town that every Friday night, they would turn over a record crate and just a bunch of rappers would just fill up the whole shop and there would be, like, an open mic. And so the first time I ever, ever rapped it, my lyrics out loud was at Dill Real on a Friday night to a room full of lyricists. But that was a big place to start, wasn't it? It was mental. All right, it was good. insane. <laughs> like, that's, that's the first, like, like, to go um, from, yeah. like, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna tell anyone that I'm doing this thing to, wow. like, OK. And then from that, from that first ever rapping out loud in that record store, the feeling that I got all over my body and the discomfort in my right. body, knowing that I didn't look right, that I didn't act right, that, you know, people ha were making assumptions and judgments about yeah, me because yeah. of what I looked like and everything. And then just getting on the mic and just feeling this communication, like being able to look people in the eye, feeling the transcendence of it, mm. you know? It's the same feeling I get mm. now, even now. Even, obviously, I'm so much better at the art of performance mm. and all the craft, but the feeling, I don't yeah. know if you agree. Yeah, no, I do. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. So from that moment, it was just like... Yeah. Well, did you, was there something that you saw that went, I could do that? <laughs> or do you know what I mean? Was there, was there no. that moment? No, it wasn't like it that. It was like, um, I just, I took the craft really seriously. Mm. And I started to study really, really seriously. Like, I, the way I would listen to albums, I used to listen and write down the lyrics mm. and then try and work out why, like, how, they'd, how the, the, the writer had got from, you know, the first line to the eighth line and, like, why the rhymes were in the place they were in. I was, re I was fascinated right, with the, yes. the mechanics. So it was like, the reason I say all this is that I was, I was really studying hard. I was trying to find out, I was going to as many rap shows as I could uh, rap my way into. Mm. I was too young to be <laughs> right. at the show, but often right. I would just stay until the crowd had gone in and then rap to the bouncers and then sometimes they would let me in. Wow. And I would just stand there and then sometimes I'd be able to rap my way backstage. And then I would... <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, this one I time. I deserve to be here. Let me show you how much I deserve to be here. It was here. like, it was, I was so full. Wow. Yeah, there was no, there was nothing else. It was like, I could see the art form and I needed to be close to it. Like, this one time I was in Paris. Method Man was playing at Alicia Momart. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'd heard about okay. Alicia Momart because yeah. the Roots talk about right. it in, yeah. in, um, in You Got Me, right, from yeah. Things Fall Apart. So I, I was like, oh, you know what? I, I left my friend who wanted to go and do something else. So I was like, I have to go to this show. I have to go to this Method Man <laughs> yeah. show. Managed to get in, watch the show, managed to wrap my way backstage I managed to get like past all of like Method Man's boys that were like guarding the different bits of the backstage. Managed to get into the backstage, <laughs> his actual dressing room. Method no. Man, his actual dressing room. Method Man was in a white, um, a white and gown. And nobody just let you breeze in. No, I was, I was like, listen, I got, I, I'm, this is who I am. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm rapping at them, doing my really? best 24. Really? Points. Yeah, yeah. There was like, I think <laughs> Supreme Mathematics was there. Yeah. Like, all these different people that I managed to get through. Then I get backstage, Method Man's in a, he's in a white fluffy robe with his like <laughs> platinum M medallion and white sports socks and that's it. And there's all these like French women and he's like talking sexy to these women. It's like, everyone's in the dressing room. Suddenly I'm in the dressing room, I'm like, oh, like now what? Like what, yeah. what am I gonna do? Like yeah. why am I here? Like why? And eventually I get over to Method Man. I'm like, yo Meth, I'm a huge fan. Like you changed my life. I just want to show you my raps. Like start rapping. I get like two words out. He's like, who the fuck got this shit? Who the fuck got this person in here? <laughs> like, I got thrown out, right? <coughs> I'm out like, right. and oh. I was like, even, even as he was throwing me out, I was still like, this, this is, is cool. amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. I've been thrown out of Method Man's dressing room. <laughs> this is so dope. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Like, I was out on the street in Alicia, outside Alicia and my Like, my heart was pounding. I was like blushing bright red. I thought, what an idiot. Why did you do that? He's just trying to relax after his show. Like, and I was like, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. That I was going to rap to him and he was going to give me a record deal. Yeah, or I yeah, don't know what yeah, I thought yeah. was going to happen. But I just stood there in the street catching my breath and I just thought, like, I, I think I was always waiting for someone to give me my break. I didn't right, realise. I see. I didn't know. So, have you got any, like, equivalent... I mean, not necessarily breaking into dressing rooms of your favourite <laughs> artist, but, like, at that kind of time, when you were around 18, like, that kind of time... 18, wow, OK. So, I was running clubs. Yeah. I started going to Theatre Royal Stratford East workshops when I was, what, 16? OK, amazing. I suppose I, I found that I didn't... I didn't there was a there was an alternative 
you know, I come from Upton Park and, you know, it was, it was rough. And there was an alternative to some of the other things that were around that seemed to give me voice. And oh, I messed up completely at school. When I say messed up, I'm really dyslexic. And no one knew. I mean, in those days, yeah. it, they, they just thought yeah. I was taking the mickey out of them. Because yeah. I'd be A star in one thing and F in another. And it wasn't that I wasn't trying in the F. My brain just couldn't. Uh, retain it. it. It got to the point where, so something like RE, which obviously is stories and philosophy, I, they, I got an A in my mock and they made me take the mock again because they thought I cheated. <laughs> yeah, it was that, but it was that, and, and I, I, could, I could say to be fair, you know, the, a dyslexia has a, a really weird way of um, trapping, trapping one's personality in it. And then, and then having a, uh, a dexterity with language that I couldn't write down. And all now, you know, my, my scripts are spelling mistakes, <laughs> and, you yeah. know, grammar's off, you know. Um, and it's, uh, it's a problem, it's a, it's a, it's a hurdle. Without, without any shadow of doubt, it's an absolute hurdle. Did you find that when you had m memorized speech or when, you, when you've got a play text and, yeah. you, and then, then it's, Oh, I couldn't. Then, I, then it was like, how do you know it so well? How wow. can you? And I, and I think what happened with me in my early days, um, especially of acting, um, especially with auditions and things, because I had to work harder than everybody else yeah. just to read the damn thing. Yeah. It was going in in a different way. So, so I, I, I know that I, because it takes me so long to read a play, I have to understand it in a way that other people don't. Um, but what was I saying? We were, talking about, we were talking about this workshop that you did at Stratford East, but then how did it go from, from that to, like, studying there or, like, getting... Right, so, so then, the... yeah, so, so then um, the natural route was to do a O-levels and A-levels in performing arts at yeah. Barking College. And so, uh, you know, I, I, did, I did well at college until we got to my A-levels. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's a mad story. It's a mad story. Um, I, I, you know, obviously I wanted to be an actor. Mm. And I don't know if you know, at the time, um, to be an actor, you had to have an equity card. Right, OK. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I got, I, I, with my Saturday money, I worked, you know, I worked in a clothes shop on a Saturday. I saved enough money to get on this agency. Uh, to get some pictures taken, to get on this agency's books, so you can get in their books, blah, blah, blah. L -l -l Cut a long story short, I ended up getting a Coca-Cola commercial, which was huge at the time. Yeah. So you had, what, you had Michael Jackson doing it, you had, <laughs> um, and just remember, I'm British, right? Yeah. So, you know, it was like, it was the Michael Jackson one, it was, oh, I can't remember, it's, you know, they were mass, massive, massive, massive things. Right. And the kid they want, in the Coca-Cola commercial <laughs> was me. I go to my, I, I'm doing uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream, playing Snug the Joiner, <laughs> right? It's the smallest part in the whole thing. <laughs> I come and tell the teacher, um, uh, who was also the head of drama, listen, I've got this commercial, I can't do, I can't play Snug the Joiner. Um, <laughs> it's like, no, you have to play something to join it. You're not so right. What, what are we going to do? I'm like, mate, it's a small. I've got. Did you hear what I just said? I'm here so that I can get an equity card so I can be an actor. I want to be an actor. I'm going to do anything to be an mm. actor. And this is. And I'm. And while I'm at college, this is me trying to be an actor. And someone is offering me the chance to be an actor. What do you mean I can't do it? Mm. So I get my parents down. And my parents are like, we want him to do it. Mm. It's us. He's going to bring in some money into the house. He needs to prove that he's, you know, I gave the whole kind of we're poor thing. Mm. <laughs> and he's going to earn some money. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you can't do it. So anyway, yeah. I did the commercial. I did the commercial. Well, you just you cut out of school and did the commercial? Uh, uh, was, yeah, yeah. I mean, I told everybody I was going to do it. Yeah. He, 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 for some reason, I think, thought that I wouldn't. Yeah. He kicked me off my A-levels. So when I look when I look you up and everything, and I see you've done um, you did a degree in uh, English literature, mm. it's like I go, yeah, that's that was that was the thing I could do, and uh, 
So yeah, no, I'm I'm purely jealous of your English literature oh. degree. Really that was am. a mad one because like <laughs> I had had a pretty bad time in in uh, education myself, mm. and I had struggled in education. Then I got into the Brit School mm. to study music, mm. um, and again I didn't really because of what was happening in my life at the time, I didn't make the most of the opportunity. Right. Anyway, by the time I got to 18, I'd like not really engaged my brain for a long time. And so I just, one day, I love to read, I love to read novels. And one day, like I live, I was living in New Cross, which is where Goldsmiths is. I just went in one day and just spoke to this guy and said like, I don't have academic qualifications. I love to read. Like, I just spoke to him on a level person to person mm. and said, could I come and do some courses? And, um, I went to the evening school at Goldsmiths. Oh, it was wow, amazing. Wow. I did one course on like Greek mythology, wow. which is why I'm here, <laughs> but, you wow. know? And I found it really warm, safe environment to ask questions and things mm. like that, because mm. other people had questions to ask as well. And then I went, after two years of doing that, I was able to transfer and do like an English literature course. Right, brilliant. Which was in the daytime. And then actually, to be honest, when I did do that, the whole setup of the class was completely different. It was just people that I think um, maybe it wasn't such a big deal for them to be in the classroom as it had been for the people that were in the evening classrooms. Right. So people were a bit too cool for school. They didn't want to talk, they didn't want to ask questions. Like, I miss, like, you know, Don Quixote? <laughs> I called it Don Quick Soap. Like, yeah. I didn't, like, yeah, I never, yeah, I've only yeah, seen yeah. it written down. So, yeah. and everyone laughed and like, you know, it's like stuff like that yeah. where you're like, oh, hang on a minute. Like, it's not okay to not know. You have right. to just keep your mouth shut and, People just want to talk about like the night out they'd had or whatever. But I think the idea of academic study, if you haven't done it, mm, or, mm. for me anyway, it was like oh, this amazing thing that's going to help me like understand my own thoughts and mm. everything. But actually, like the practice, the actual daily practice of writing, reading, applying yourself to learning and understanding new ideas, reading other playwrights, mm, reading mm. other writers, that was the thing I think that um, yeah, priceless. I learned so much because I I was just reading all the time because wow. you had to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when it's when it's amazing, it must be a daunting prospect knowing that you you get to fill these rooms. You know, yeah. you get to think about what words get spoken on these stages, and yeah. Yeah. it must be an incredible. Well, I don't know. How is it? How does it feel? <laughs> right now, it's a bit. It's all a bit new. Yeah. If I'm really honest. It's really new and a little unreal. And and it's funny. I I did a, a talk in a school the other day, Mossbourne Academy. And um, one of the questions was, uh, what does it feel like to be in control and to have autonomy? And how much autonomy do you have? Mm. <clears throat> and it question. really, really was kind of like, I don't see anything that is about being in control. I think and where I came out of it was, I was actually thinking, actually what it does is it means that it puts me in a position where I'm allowed to collaborate with people that I want to collaborate with. Mm. It doesn't put me in a position of controlling anything. It means that I can go, what do you think? Right, okay, yeah, mm. let's come and do this together. Yeah, I mean, and obviously, as I said, I'm getting used to the position or, you know, trying to grapple with what the position actually is. Uh, so maybe in a year's time, I'll be like, no, it's all about control. <laughs> <laughs> i got loads of power. Oh, I love loads of autonomy, man. <laughs> all about telling people what to do and where to stand. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, I predict not, but, you know, um, yes, yeah, it's new to me. So, Paradise. Mm. Paradise, your play. It's an adaptation of a very old play. Sophocles' um, original play was called Philoctetes. It is the story of a soldier, a wounded soldier who's abandoned uh, and left on an island. And Sophocles was a general. He'd been fighting this huge war, the Peloponnesian War, that had been going on for, I'm going to say 20 years, but a Greek scholar might correct that. But <laughs> okay. it was a long war. Greek, Greece were losing. Greece were getting hammered in this war. And Sophocles came home and he built this shrine in his garden. And he wrote this, essentially, this anti-war play. Um, and something that I learned from this experience is that I, I got to work with a Greek scholar who did a literal translation, you know, like, rather than island, yeah. sea-surrounded land. You know, this is right. how it was yes. in the Greek. Yes. Yeah. And she's an amazing woman called Helen Eastman, and she said that when the plays would begin, they would march, the war orphans would do this kind of lap of honour around the theatre, around the space, and then and they would sit in the front seats, all the war, all the, all the war orphans would sit in the front seat of the theatre, 
and the theatre took over this parental role and gave all this glory to the fact that wow. they'd lost a parent. Wow. There was just all this nuance to it that I was really struggling to understand how to translate it into a contemporary morality. Like, mm. How do you take something from a time that was so different right, yes. in terms of ethics and morality and make it mean something to us? How does that feel? Incredible. I feel yeah. so excited. Yeah. I feel like... It's going to be powerful for all yeah. of us involved. I really do feel like I can't wait. I feel like the audience is going to feel elated by yeah. some of the some of the joy that's no, that I is agree. there. You know, like I agree. Have, have you find do you find an easy marriage with that, knowing that one piece is going to be over there and one piece I am going to do myself and yeah, it's um, it's not. I, I have no like I'm not precious about the text that I write. I feel like when I'm in my flow, it just it's there. It's happening. Yeah. So. What I love is being with people in a room and seeing when it isn't working, hearing when it isn't working, changing, having the chance to just play and just yeah. muck around with it and just get deeper and deeper into it. And like, when, I'm, when I have my own text, when I'm committing it to my body memory and I'm going out, over the course of the tour, the words change, things happen, the yeah. text develops, like, there's all this nuance that I have, but it's, it's private. It happens yeah. between me and my text. Right, yeah. But when yeah. I'm in a room with actors or like, or with musicians, yeah. just feels like so joyful. That, yeah. And even if what I'm talking about is dark, even yeah. if I'm expressing something that has come from a difficult place, it means that I can take the pressure off myself and I begin to enjoy the work that I put in to have the skill set to be able to just freestyle, you know? Yeah, yeah you, talk, you talk about it so eloquently. It's beautiful to hear you um, put it down so cleanly. And clearly, and it was I want to ask you a question that I, because I have never asked this of an actor, but I always think about it. How does it feel to ha to be so objectified that, like, literally by the part, the part is looking for some something that fills the um, requirements of the yeah, part, yeah. and then you have to walk in to a room where people are looking for a specific thing? Like, yeah. how does it feel? Well, I, I suppose, I suppose, I it's a challenge. So it's yeah. a challenge, and, and I think it's. Probably that's majorly part of the reason why I ended up writing and, and directing was that element of the industry mm. I find too restrictive and uncreative um, for me. Mm. Um, I, suppose, I suppose why I came up and how I came up through acting was the desire to play lots of different people, lots of different characters, and to create the characters and to build the characters. So when I first started, you'd go to an interview and you'd talk about what you would do with that part. You'd talk about how you create this part and what we would come out with together. Mm. And so this idea of endgaming um, what you're going to do in an audition is, is quite controversial for me personally. Mm. And the, the more that crept into the industry as in you have to be like this and and, and the thing and i suppose for what, <laughs> i suppose if i'm really honest you know uh skinny black guy <laughs> you know was never down on no one was, no one was going yeah we need a skinny black guy from upton park who's kind of average <laughs> you know what i mean it was always big black guy big black man comes in big clever black man comes in Big, angry black man comes in. Mm. Big, you know what I mean? And so I didn't quite kind of fit in, uh, into a lot of um, people's ideas on, on the black guy that they wanted to be the one black guy in the film or in the play. Yeah, so it's, it's been, the writing for me came out of a desire to, to uh, bring width to the understanding of, of the types of black people that there are. Yeah, for sure. You I know. hear you. Um, yeah. So, like, on my first play that I wrote, yeah. it was called Wasted, mm. and we put a call out um, for the actors to come and audition, and we mm. got to the end of the first days of auditions, yeah. and I said to the director at the time, I was like, why are all the people that have come to read for this part white? Because in my mind, the characters were not all white, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I hadn't written that specifically. specifically. Yeah, I would yeah. just put a call out for, yeah. I suppose it was like, it's like an age bracket, yeah. that's what they were looking for. Said to the director, how come they're all white? 
And he said to me, unless you specify... Specify, exactly. So if you just put a call out for, like, female actor 24 to 28 or whatever, mm. that's just white people yeah. that are going to come. Yeah. And, like, you don't get to... You, you can't put a call out for, like, dynamic open soul. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you, like, no, 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 exactly. The person who's going to get yeah. my language, you have yeah. to objectify and, like, you know, I, f I have found that quite, um, as you say, uncreative. Mm. So I... It's really interesting for me to hear your yeah, experience. Yeah, like... it's just limiting. I, I suppose I always felt it was limiting me. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, yeah. Are you thinking about when you're reading plays or when you're thinking about what to programme, like, are you feeling that there are qualities that you're looking for that you wouldn't have been looking for a year ago before before what's just happened happened? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, the the the, um, the whole Black Lives Matter movement mm. that um, obviously started way before then, last year. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, oh, so it's just happened. It's like, no, no, kneeling's been going on for quite a while now. Mm. Um, has Has infected and produced a will mm. to to um, to allow people of colour, um, uh, people that are not considered the mainstream mm. in any aspect. It's allowed a um, an understanding that that uh, we need some space as well, and we need the space as well. So yes, uh, um, you know we'll we'll definitely be taking that into the the whole heart of the building, to be honest. You know, Rufus has been uh, amazing and the rest of the building has been amazing in, try in trying to um, accept the will of the people. Mm. And, and obviously yeah. putting on your work here during that. I mean, huge, that, huge, you know? it's huge, it's yeah. huge. In terms of your piece feeling like it, it's a piece that's coming out of a pandemic, does that feel good for you? Is it? Is it? Is it... Yeah. Does the storyline aid that? How does that feel for you coming, you know, this being what you, you're you offering yeah. to the world after a... It's a really good way of putting it. during. I mean, we're still going to be during yeah. it. Yeah. You know. It's a really good way of putting it. I feel like whatever is happening in the world, in the room, for people privately in their own lives, will affect what is happening in the language. Mm. Like, you, if, as a writer, you pay particular attention to a present moment mm. and you offer that moment yeah, yeah. then it will be full of the context of whatever is happening on the micro and the macro yeah. and i feel like the less you attempt to make that happen the more freedom it has Absolutely. to really really yeah. take resonance yeah. so it's like of course the pandemic is going to be in the room of yeah. course yeah. and then you go through the play and you're looking at these things that were not intentionally written to evoke what right, we've yes. been through yeah. but of course it's going to happen yeah. Yeah. there's yeah. you know there's a guy in a cave mm. And he's living in this cave alone and he's abandoned. Right, and yeah. so obviously there is yeah. going to be some resonance. And yeah. there's, it's a cast of 12. So like, even just having 12 people yeah. inhabiting yeah. the same space yeah. is going to be saying something about um, what we've all just been through. But, yeah. How does it feel for you being, being at the centre of that? Like utter terror. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, like, I really didn't think I, that's what you were going to say. But that's it. It's like, <laughs> I believe... Yeah. My friend used to say to me, not if, but when. Yeah. And, and I, I started to believe that. I started yeah, to think, yeah, yeah OK. Like, and also you have this twin thing of, like, I don't deserve this or I'm not good enough right, or right, all right. that kind of stuff. But with this opportunity, yeah. the feeling is just elation, excitement. Yeah. I can't wait for my words to be spoken again in, in yeah. public place. And yeah. I, So all of that comes into my head. All of the times that I workshop this play with these incredible actors, all these really cool people have been involved in bringing this thing to life. And when I think about the National Theatre, this big stage, this big, you know, the imposing building, mm, you walk down mm. the South Bank, you look at it, it's like... Yeah. And just, I just feel, like, joy. That's it. I just feel joy and, and hope for, like that, that it can be something that lifts, lifts mm. people. There's, a, there's violence at the heart of the play, but... I hope that the feeling people get is just like whew, power. Yeah, I think they will. So, um, what what's next for you? What's next for you in the pandemic after this? Basically, I would have been on tour for this last year. Mm. So lots of gigs got cancelled. I wasn't able to right. do that, of course. Right, yeah. But the flip side of that is that I've had some time to right. write, yeah. to think, to like to deal with some stuff that I did not have the time to deal with. Right, you know, right, it's like yeah. we often don't make time 
to take care of ourselves when there's so much else to take care yeah, of. Yeah. Other people and like work and whatever. So I feel really grateful for having had this time to take stock and I'm really excited to get back out on the road. I've made a new album, I've got a new book of poems I'm working on, wow, there's brilliant. this play, brilliant. like there's... There's it, lots going on. Yeah, it's like I can feel it. It's, I've had time to recalibrate and now my creativity feels like it's, it's saying thank you yeah. for me giving it a bit of attention. Right, 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 right. And it's, it's like, boom, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm rewired, yeah. I'm ready, yeah. like the sparks are flying again. I don't know about you, but it can, when you've got a big workload mm. and the pressure's on, it can really, it can kick me into a, a certain kind of creative mode. Yeah, yeah. But I have found that that pressure being taken away has opened up a kind of creativity that I haven't actually experienced since before all this, before my career. Like, I feel like oh, a teenager right, again. Oh, right, right, really? Yeah. Does that resonate with you? you? Well, no, because this bloody year's been balmy. <laughs> <laughs> balmy. I've, I literally haven't stopped. It's just been, it's an amazing time. I mean, it's an, a, an amazing time to, to, um, well, when I say amazing, I mean extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, this is it. This is it. It's an extraordinary time to um, produce work in. Yeah. OK, so talking of extraordinary moments to produce work, has there been any that you can think of in your creative life that you're like... Well, wow. um, I, th I, think, I think it's... Oh, so hard. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I directed a musical called The Big Life. Yeah, that's right. And... Um, that was an insane sort of, I want to use the word homecoming, because Stratford felt like a, my home. And being West Indian, you know, my parents being Jamaican, there was, there was a, 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 a real uh, desire from me to be able to articulate my parents' story mm. and to articulate it in a way that really spoke to the good-natured, hard-working, ambitious people that they are. And uh, so, so the big life was really important in showing how proud I was, mm. or am, of their, their choices. And uh, so to feel like I was giving something back to that generation and to, and to uh, all the West Indians that came over was, was massively um, uh, joyous and... and um, it, it, I suppose it, it made me feel that I was useful. It centres me when I feel as though I'm trying to put something in the world that, that will help us understand it. I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to make the world a better place or anything. I just, I just find pleasure and it fulfills me to know that I'm, I'm putting something out that might make us actually see the, the scope mm. of what we're actually dealing with. Yeah. And what's yours? What's your one then? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still with yours at the minute. I could, I'm just <laughs> like, wow, that was really um, yeah, poignantly expressed. For me personally, I think it's important to say that the best moments are not the moments when it's all going well, but it's the moments when it's going really, really badly. Like how you get up from that. Mm -hmm. that they're the moments <clears throat> that I'm like, I'm proud of myself for that yeah. that stuff, basically. Like, yeah. I'm a massive boxing fan. I oh, I'm, don't <laughs> stop letting your life. Really? Yeah, yeah. We're going to chat about this after this. <laughs> when this thing's stopped, we're going to be chatting about it. <laughs> really? Yeah, I love boxing. Well, you got... We, I, do you, I, I found out earlier that Kay hadn't seen um, uh, Death of England. Yeah. Boxing features all the way through it. Okay, so Fascinating. I, I Go I on, need, talk to I me about to your... So, your... basically, the, and whenever... The thing that I, I, fight, I buzz off so much when I'm watching boxing or when I'm thinking well, I'm like engaging with the the boxers that I love it's how you get up mm. it's, it's how you get up after a knockdown it's yeah. like yeah it's how you find the energy after someone is trying to hit you in the face yeah this is for me this is the big teaching that um you don't get you know awarded for every time you get things wrong <laughs> but you should do you know yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. so for example I wrote a novel for me, novels are the hardest thing that you can, that I can do. Mm. There's, there's, it's like an endurance. It's so, oh, so yeah. challenging. I wrote a novel and it was rejected. And it was like something that I really put a lot of... Um, I was having some mental health problems. Like This novel was, it was a dark piece, but mm. I put everything into it. And then when it didn't do to my editor what I thought it might or something, I had to look again and I had to face this failure. Mm. Like, you know, like... 
I didn't want to write. I felt like I, I, all the wind had gone out of my sails. It was like, I don't know how to begin again. It's like all different kinds of things. Anyway, that's a story for another day. But No, but it isn't. It isn't because it, 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 it so speaks to, to the, especially when you think of theatre, especially as an actor, you know, you go, right, that, that's that one over. <sighs> OK, <laughs> I'll go, yeah. go do it again do tomorrow it again. night. You know, and, and, and the amount of times I, I know I've made mistakes on the stage in, in front of people and, you know, I, I, it's, it's weird because I don't, I don't dry, but I, I'm the, 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 I'll put two lines together. My dyslexia just makes something, just go, wow. blah, blah, blah. it's like, wow, I didn't understand what I said, so I don't think they did. You know, it's that sort of thing where you kind of go, just keep going. Did you yeah. just keep going? They might not have noticed. And then afterwards, you're like, you did that thing where you put that line next to that line and made them one line. Yeah. You know, and, and um, it's, it's like, inherent. It's in a show like that, when you've done something like that, then I don't know about for you, but it's like it charges you up with this yeah. new energy. So then yeah. the people in the audience, they probably they probably didn't even notice that. But then what Very they will true. notice is that then you've got this new. You will be hitting every line even harder because you're like absolutely. And I think audiences get it when when a mistake happens. You, you know, you're acting yeah. and you pick up the glass and the gla glass falls. Yeah. And everybody, everybody knows that weren't meant to happen. Yeah. And suddenly everything is charged. Yeah. And and that yeah. and it's and it's live. It really feels live. And in a way that you know that's what I'm always trying to create with actors, and that's what I'm trying to create as an actor is that is that th that moment where it stays so fresh yeah. that everybody recognises. This is the first time this is happening. Yeah, yeah, and that is, even though every night it is the first time that it's happening, yeah, yeah. when something happens that makes it the first time, <laughs> yeah. everybody, a, yeah, yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you mean, yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel about um, when the audience is back in the room? How do you think it will feel for everybody to come oh, back? Oh, goodness scene? gracious, I, 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 well, you know, having experienced it a little bit with, um, with Death of England, mm. Uh, during the uh, during the second, just before the second lockdown, yeah. it was like people were coming to church, you know. And, and whilst I hope that people were enjoying the show, <laughs> what we actually <laughs> were doing, um, I think I think we were really fortunate to be in the midst of such a welcomed experience. People want that experience. People were starved of that experience. Mm. And uh, to be around people who feel like they're finally owning that feeling again was, was something to behold. It really was. Really did much. it change the play when the audience came in the room? Um, did it change the play? You see, I, I'm a believer, I am a believer that audiences make the work. Yeah. It's the space between the audience and the stage or the performer that, that creates the energy, that creates the thing that I was originally yeah. talking about, yeah, yeah. Where, where we have that, to use your word, communion. Yeah, yeah. OK, Clint. Yeah. <laughs> you are Deputy Artistic Director yeah. of the National Theatre. Yeah. What is your vision? Ah, vision. I want to increase the reach. Mm. I, 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 there's, there's so much amazing work that happens in this building that uh, that doesn't get seen by the majority. Yeah. And I want the amazing work to be seen by the majority, and I want the majority to be able to, to um, stand on these stages and, and have their voices heard. That's beautiful. Thank yes. you. Cheers. It's so good to hear. Cheers. Cheers. Listen, we've got to wrap up, haven't we? And, yeah. and um, I just have to say, it's been an honour. I, I, love, I love the way you articulate things and, and I, I, I really am, um, um, no, this, this will live with me. Yeah. Really, this will live with me. I'm, I'm really chuffed and honoured. Yeah, thank me too. You. It's been thank great you. to talk to you. And on behalf of the National Theatre, thank you again. And thank you for your amazing play. Wow, oh, it's my Can't pleasure. wait to see it. Thank you for having it. It's been great. Yeah. It's been great, a real honour. Thank it's been you. Great. We'll have to continue our boxing chat. We certainly are. I want to know who your favourite is. See you later. <laughs> Take care.